data. Because the amount of, of data that we're trying to keep track of is smaller than what it would be in a hard drive, we have less ECC data. So we actually have a smaller amount that we actually have to store there because we're now tracking zeros and ones instead of this encoded string that actually shows up here on the left-hand side for a hard drive. So there's quite a bit of differences. <clears throat> so physically, when you're looking at flash memory sticks versus solid-state disks, what you've got is, if this is, if this is your memory stick, let's kind of compare the differences between the two. <clears throat> so now, on your memory stick, basically, you have something that's kind of like a control chip. Basically, this is the device that you're going to talk to. You're going to tell it what you're going to do with it. And you're basically going to pass commands to it, kind of like a standard controller or something you might, might deal with. And there's a lot of fluff and stuff that happens inside of how you're going to communicate with this chip and what you're going to do with it. But ultimately, the point becomes, when you plug it into your computer, it has no processor on the device. It has no way of calculating anything. So it has to use a driver on your system. So when you plug in a memory stick, you get like the mass storage driver starts up. And at that point in time, the mass storage driver basically takes over and has to do all the fundamental work for what's happening on the memory stick. And it's using your host processor to do that. Because it has no processor of its own, all the content for ECC or changes or bad blocks or wear leveling all has to physically be done inside your computer using your processor, passing it back and taking care of the chips itself because it has no way of doing that. So fundamentally, this is what it would look like from some of the operating systems. This is part of TrueFS, FFS, which is uh, uh, SanDisk. <clears throat> So basically, it's pretty dumb from that standpoint. You're only going to make some changes to it. But on a solid-state disk, it's got a whole different set of commands of what it has to deal with. One of the things is, is that it has, to be, it has to be responsible for all the NAND functions. It has to be responsible for all the bad device blocks. Everything that happens on this chip physically has to happen because there's no direct driver dealing with that. It's making an IDE call or a SATA call to it and physically... Uh, conforming to one of the ATA standards, and then physically the drive itself has to kind of virtualize the functions that are going to happen below it, and it divides you from what's actually happening on the chip. So physically, if this is happening, what it means is in forensics, if I'm requesting the, the sector for 125, and I go to 125, and I do that, say, two or three times in a row, and something else has been going on, you know, even, even an amount of time has passed, Sector 125 may no longer be the same sector. It may not be in the same location. It's going to virtualize a table, and it's going to make some changes to the content, and it's going to shuffle it around during some of its wear leveling schemes. And as you can see, if all of this is happening physically in this device here, and you're doing wear leveling, your bad block management, all your erase cycles, your start locations, your ECC management, and you ignore write protect calls, and when I say ignore write protect calls, I don't mean the same thing as I take a write blocker in forensics and I put a write blocker on my device before it talks to the hard drive, to the solid state disk. Uh, what I mean is, is that these, each one of these chips, each one of the NAND chips, has a leg on it that basically has a write protect on it. And so some of you can see that if you look at um, physically like uh, the disk that you put in your camera, there's a little switch on the side. You can lock and unlock. It actually is physically wired to the chip itself and it can lock and unlock. And what it's basically saying here is it's going to ignore all of those types of things so that it can bind all the memory together and virtualize it as one and then ignore that write protect call or any of the extra calls that it's going to have. And so one of the things I want to point out though is that just by power being applied to this device, it is completely plausible that under certain pieces of code running, it can actually still be swapping content around, doing its garbage collection routines and erasing content just because it's powered. So it doesn't matter if you have a write blocker in front of it. If you're doing forensics and you've powered this device so that you can do a copy of it, garbage collection's running. And you can't stop it. At least currently right now, I don't know of a way to stop it. Uh, maybe some people can reverse engineer some chips, make some changes to some code or something. But at least at this point, that may affect us and it may cause us some major problems. And the longer it's plugged in and you leave it overnight and you come back tomorrow, it may be done with its garbage collection routine and it erased more data then you thought it was going to erase during that time span, even though it's going to be fairly quick at actually erasing that data because it has its own processor. So I just want to make sure that's clear to people that are dealing with forensics. So one of the other things that, that may take a little bit to try to understand is that because a sector has to be erased before a new sector can be written to it, 
that gets rid of slack space. Because if you think about it, slack space basically is if you have a sector and it's 512 bytes and I write 400 bytes to that sector, I have that extra amount that's left out there that hasn't been written. And our hard drives are really lazy. They don't really do functions when they're not asked to do them because it takes processor power and other time. So you have this extra amount of data that's left out there. Well, in solid state disks, it's got to erase it and move the content there. So you're going to get a, a measurably amount, a lot smaller amount of slack space. Some of it's going to be because of the way that content is divided up inside the hard drives with uh, clusters and things like that. But generally, you're not going to get the quantity of data that you had before. You're also going to be missing a lot of the unallocated space. Unallocated space is going to become zeros, like I showed previously in some of the slides. So, but this is the major functions that are different between that SSD control chip. So I want to just talk a little bit about what, what happens in hard drives. In hard drives, when you have a bad hard drive, you go through all these functions. You can, you can physically talk to the SA area. I've covered all this in other speeches, so you can actually go in detail and look at some of this content. But physically, on a hard drive, you have this SA area that stores content that, with the right equipment, you can go and look at and you can make changes to. But that's not true of solid state. Physically in solid state, we can't talk to all these things. They've, they've changed some of the legacy things that we can talk to now. And we don't know how to request these tables and look at these tables. We're not the developers. And the developers are physically, because say SanDisk is trying to kind of you know be the king of the market or something like that, they may not be releasing any of their IP property to other vendors so that they can study or do something about it. So we don't get that code unless somebody's going to reverse engineer it. So, Physically, right now, we're looking at content that's changing, and we have no idea what's changing. Also in hard drives, we have this division of content that's divided up into what's called utility block addressing. Basically, what they do is they take like a bad block list, and they say, on one drive, I might have a bad block list that is uh, going to need three sectors to write to. But on a different size hard drive, a, a 250 compared to 100 meg, you know, maybe I need a bigger bad block list. So now I'm going to have five sectors that comprise what the bad block list is. And so to do that, they didn't want to call it something different every time. So basically, they came up with utility block addressing. So you may have a utility block addressing for your bad block list be number one. And that's physically what you've gotten for a breakdown. Well, again, we don't know that content in solid state. It doesn't look anything like that at all. Physically, this is generally what you're looking at in solid state disks. You have a device area, and you'll notice that the very first thing is only the first block is guaranteed to be good. The first block is the only thing that they're going to try to say is a high enough quality chip that it wasn't sold to Fry's or somebody else's memory stick. They use a good portion of that for the very first block so that they can write tables and pointers and things too so that that block doesn't go bad telling you where all your content is. It doesn't move that piece around, but it does move all the other content around. Then you have your header list, and then you have a, tran a transition, basically, from what your LBA blocks are to, to PBAs. So your LBA block, your logical block addressing, is now translated to the physical block addressing. We don't have that in hard drives. We don't have it in that fashion. Typically, there's still a translation going on, but it's, uh, it's you know, sectors and heads from that standpoint, not where our LBA block is. You can still go find that and know exactly where it is. But in solid state disk, you don't know that. It's a table you don't have access to, you can't talk to at all. And then you have your free list with your bad block list. Basically, when the device powers up and it goes through its initialization process, it does build a list of the good sectors that content can be written to. So it gets there faster for things that are free. So physically, it's actually initializing and building that list. And again, you don't have access to that list. You have no idea what's going on there. The only one you have access to at all is the user accessible area. That's where your data is stored. But if you see kind of in the highlight behind this, there may be a set of chips. There may be 16 chips that are now linked together and virtualized for the amount of space that you need to make up 32 gigs or 64 gigs. And so it's spread across all of those chips. So you don't even know where physically your content is stored if you want to start trying to break this down. Again, reverse engineering is the only way that you're going to be able to try to break down where this content exists, where these tables are, and how to reverse them, and what this particular piece of code is doing that's different than everybody else's code. So you're going to have to do it for every single device that you have to try to understand better and better over time until somebody is a winner and we, you know, we only have four manufacturers or something, again, like we have with hard drives. <clears throat> so when you're dealing with...